Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Ask the SCSA. My name is Kara Bildfell. I'll be hosting today. I hope everybody had a wonderful long weekend. Um, and as always, we are going to start with introductions. So I'll just go with who I see first on my screen here. Laura, you want to go first? Sure. My name is Laura Lodge. I'm a safety advisor with the SCSA. Um, I have been with them for um, close five and a half years, six years almost now. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Lori, you want to go next? Good morning. Uh, yes, hope everyone had a good long weekend. I'm Lori Sins, Program Administrator at the SCSA out of the Regina office. I've been with the SCSA for 10 years and uh, the programs area covers CORE, C-CORE, NCSO, and HSA. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Ed, you want to go next? <coughs> sure. I'm Ed Pyle, Manager of Corporate Development here at the SCSA. Thanks, Ed. Bill seems to be having some technical difficulties. So Bill's an advisor out of our Saskatoon office. Uh, as soon as he gets his microphone working again, I'm sure we'll hear, hear from him. Uh, first and foremost, we have uh, some exciting stuff to bring to you today. So I think, um, I think I'll think i let Ed go first, talking about our new e-passports. Sure, thanks, Kara. So I'm here to introduce our e-passport, which is a new system we have just launched uh, the background on it is that studies have shown that in the construction industry, productivity benefits would be realized if firms had improved access to business intelligence. Uh, live on the site or as close to the point of work as it could possibly be. So what we've done to bring some of those, uh, some of that business intelligence to people in the field is we've opened up our training record to members in an online site. Our, sorry, rather our training records to our members on an online site. So that's 140,000 uh, training records that we're opening up to, uh, to a system via a logon. Um, the system itself is at my.scsaonline.ca and it augments the paper records that people may have seen in the past. So in the past, if you attended training with us, you'd, you'd receive a certificate, a uh, paper certificate, or a passbook where you got where you got a stamp, or you'd go into the office and get a transcript printed off. Well, this system it goes a step further than that. What it does is it opens up that information, that same information with fewer steps. So what someone will be able to do is they'll be able to go to my.scsaonline.ca and view their view their training history, print off certificates, and update their contact information so the SCSA can always reach you. That's, uh, that's a, a quick summary of what the system does. So I'll just go into showing people the system very quickly. I'll go quite fast and I'll skip a few steps, but if you want to view videos on how to do any of these steps yourself, they are available on our YouTube channel, uh, which somebody hopefully can post in the chat. Um, just view those videos, go in, see your, see your uh, training history, print off certificates if you need them and uh, and go from there. So I'll, uh, I'll share my screen here and I'll quickly show you what you can see in the system. And I'll just give that a second for everyone to catch up. Can somebody on the panel give me a nod when they see the uh, website up and running? Okay, great. Everybody's seeing a, a a, a log on screen here. Now, if this is your first time log on, you'll have to activate your account and that'll require some information. The first piece of information it will ask for is your SCSA ID. Now, if you still have your passbook handy, your SCSA ID will be printed in your passbook. If you don't have your SCSA ID, you can just give our offices a call or send an email and we can give that to you. It will also ask for your, uh, your phone number and your uh, the postal code we have on file for you. And if you don't remember that, just reach out to the SCSA and we can generally get you going in a couple of minutes. So you activate your account that way and at that time you'll set up a username. So once you have a username, you just sign in with your username like you do into any other website. So this is my ID. I'll sign in here. Very quick one step sign in. Uh, I have access to a few things other people don't have access to, but most people will just see their training history, which will look just like this. As you can see, somebody uh, played a trick on me and changed my profile photo. Um, but anyway, we'll move on from that. Uh, you can see, so you can see my name, you can see my contact information. 
you can scroll down and these are all the court the SCSA courses I've taken you can see that all my courses I hold right now are valid still you can see my completion date and the title of the course if I wanted to go in and replace print a replacement certificate for one of the courses I would take I would just click on it there's a printable certificate and as you can see I could hit print the other option you will find in here is it has a QR code reader which is difficult for me to reach but if you can um, you go into that QR code reader you can hold up your QR code and have somebody scan that with their phone and that will show your photo your training history and your certificates with uh, without any extra steps so for us this is a big step in the right direction we are hoping to get more services online and more of that business intelligence available to our members in the field without having to come into our office after all saskatchewan's a, a very big province and for somebody to drive in from from uh, macklin or buffalo narrows to to get a certificate printed that's a major inconvenience this log on will replace hopefully quite a few of those uh, those trips and errands and uh, and improve our service overall it's quite a new workflow we're, we're very proud of it and it's going to be a, uh, a system that we're going to augment down the road with other methods of business intelligence. In the next few months, you should see an update to our mobile app. You will see an analytics environment be, be brought up and that will all be run off your SCSA ID. So you will only need to remember one ID. So keep that in mind, even if uh, an e-passport or your online training history is not something you're interested in this will be a big service improvement for our members so with that said i'll uh, i'll open it up to questions or comments thanks ed that's awesome um yeah uh, i forgot to mention at the beginning if you do have a question for one of our panelists just we ask that you use the q a feature if you use the chat we're going to lose those at the end so we like to try to compile a faq frequently asked questions and have those available to our members. So just try to use the Q&A function and I will answer any questions that are coming in. Uh, next, I think we have something from Laura. Laura, you wanna take over? Sure, um, so just to kind of follow up Ed's presentation and the launch of the e-passport, um, we just wanted to take some time to kind of go over some of the specifics regarding training in Saskatchewan and um, and how that pertains to, to business operations. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, yes, okay. Do you guys see what I see? Or the presentation, yes? Okay, awesome. So we'll kinda, roll right into it so the first things i have are some definitions and terms here so the first one being competent so that means possessing uh, the knowledge experience training uh, to perform a specific duty um, competency is mentioned throughout the ohs act and regulations um, it means you can carry out a task successfully with little to no supervision um, the next definition that comes up a lot during tr regarding training um, is a supervisor. So this means that any individual who's authorized by an employer to oversee or direct the work uh, of an employer's workers. This definition is important because supervisors are usually the ones doing um, some sort of training or mentoring uh, with someone who isn't quite competent. So employers do have a duty to ensure that supervisors are competent uh, to perform their duties and oversee and direct the work of others. Um, and they need to make sure that the people that are working under them are safe. Um, another important definition is train. So this means to give information and explanation um, and require a practical demonstration that the worker has acquired that skill or knowledge. Um, so it's not just about telling someone how to do something and then kind of walk in away. It means to follow through on that training till the end. Um, we often speak in training of the tell, show, do, review method um, to ensure that workers both have the opportunity to learn the information, but also practice with the guidance of a competent supervisor. And then qualified. So qualified means possessing a recognized degree, recognized certificate, or a recognized professional standing. 
Um, this can range anywhere from a journeyman certification to a professional designation to a university degree. Um, so a couple more before we keep going. Um, formal, so formal training includes uh, training courses that are taken at recognized schools or associations. Um, and it often includes certification following successful completion of, uh, of the training. <clears throat> uh, informal training, so this is something uh, that often happens every day and people kind of overlook it. So anything from safety meetings to toolbox talks, job rotation, or even coaching and mentoring programs can be considered an informal uh, method of training. Um, just because it's informal doesn't mean it's not documented. So uh, we, we stress the importance of documenting all forms of training, whether they're formal or informal. And the final definition to talk about here is due diligence. So these are reasonable steps that are taken by a person to satisfy legal requirement. Um, we're gonna talk more about this, um, what it means in a few slides, so. So again, just some different models of training. They can take many forms. They can be offered by a wide range of organizations. So again, like I said, uh, accredited schools, degrees, diplomas, trade schools um, are a method of formal training. Industry accepted programs, so designations or awareness courses or workshops and seminars. Uh, formal in-house training, um, so that can be anything site specific, um, such as orientations or experience hours if you're collecting hours for either a journeyman certificate or, or other things. Um, or as well, WMIS. So we have like a WMIS train the trainer course. So a lot of companies, they do that in-house training. So that's a formal method of training. Informal training. So again, this can include anything from toolbox talks that are, that are documented with names of attendees and, uh, and the information discussed. Uh, safety meetings, these are just generally more formalized um, and usually have follow-up assigned to individuals. Coaching and mentoring, um, these training opportunities should be documented just like anything else. Uh, mentoring programs often have detailed steps or roles that can be adjusted for the person in the role. Um, workshops and seminars, so depending on the program you're taking and seminars, um, they can be more or less formalized. Um, you can still document it if it's not, uh, if you don't get a certification at the end of that, you can still document that you were there and what you learned and things from it. Um, job rotation as well, so companies often use this to expose workers to different parts of the organization, make sure they understand how everything works. Um, and it can as well be documented to include all aspects of the tasks. Um, just because it's informal doesn't mean it's any less important. Again, the key to success with this is to document every training occurrence. So going into due diligence and training. So again, due diligence, oh, look at that. I'm missing some stuff on my slide, but again, it's reasonable steps taken by a person in order to satisfy a legal requirement. So how does this apply to the workplace? Um, we hear this term a lot. It often denotes steps you might take to protect yourself when making a big purchase, but due diligence is also a legal defense in proceedings. So it's often described as doing everything that is reasonably practicable um, to prevent an incident from occurring. Now, reasonably practicable, um, what does that mean? So practicable means it's performable, it's feasible and it's possible given the current knowledge, technology and invention. And reasonable is a standard of care that would be expected of an ordinary person, um, an ordinary reasonable prudent person in the same circumstances to avoid liability. So oh, it's an objective standard, the term reasonable. So consideration isn't given to defendant's thought process or personal awareness of danger or to individual characteristics. Um, it's a standard that takes into account both the practicalities of what an ordinary person would do and uh, in, in legal proceedings, what a judge believes uh, a person should do or what the legislation requires them to do. So we have a little excerpt here from the Saskatchewan OHS Act. So this is uh, section 3-81. Um, the first part of it's a bit of uh, is a bit wordy, but the highlighted yellow part is the important part of that section. So the onus is on the accused to prove that training met provided met the requirements of this part and the regulations made pursuant to this part. So basically, um, following the due diligence is 
the onus will be on the employer to ensure that their workers uh, were sufficiently trained, that the training included all the information that they needed. So um, it's important to note that you can't, you know, just send somebody for training and kind of leave it at that, that it's, um, you have to make sure that it's going to be sufficient for what they need to do. So training responsibilities. Um, so just a couple basic ones with employers and supervisors. So employers, they are required um, to provide the necessary training to protect their workers' health and safety. Um, they have to provide competent supervision. And as well, the, the act requires them to review training as necessary. And through the act, there is a lot of specific training that needs to be reviewed regularly. Uh, supervisors, they need to ensure the health and safety of anyone under their direction. So we talked about that earlier with the definitions. And they also have to ensure that workers comply with the act, as well as regulations and company policies. Workers also have some general duties when it comes to training. So workers all have to comply with the act and regulations. That doesn't just apply to the employer. Um, protect your own health and safety and that of others. Use the safeguards, appliances, and the personal protective equipment provided. And participate in and utilize the training provided as well. Um, as well as you're responsible to follow any written safe work practices or procedures that your employer has provided. Now with reviewing or refreshing training, um, so some courses may require review, annual review, um, such as WIMIS to make sure that everything's up to date and people have the right training, um, or anything site specific, so things like orientations might need to be updated to make sure that they have the most relevant information. Um, any updated or changed information in the program, as well as paying attention to courses that don't expire. Oftentimes people take a course that doesn't expire and then they never kind of discuss that information again. So um, if, if you took a course and it's not something that you do regularly, um, don't just assume a course you took five years ago is gonna be sufficient. You might wanna refresh your employees and make sure that they have the most uh, relevant information. So with ongoing uh, training is never just a one and done. Uh, most people don't retain information that they've only been heard or shown once. So it's important to review and refresh where necessary and not to overlook the value of repetition so that what is expected becomes second nature. So again, uh, the legislation actually requires that when a worker moves from one site to another that they receive training in that site. So site orientations um, should be reviewed regularly. Emergency drills are another part of the act that's required. So making sure that you carry out um, practices and people are trained in what to do in the event of emergencies. First aid as well is another legislative requirement. So um, depending on the size of your workplace, the location, um, it'll tell the act and the regulations will tell you specifically what you need to have in place and what sort of training that your employees need to have. Um, any updated safe work practices or safe job procedures. Um, so as those get updated and reviewed, if you're part of uh, or if you're a core company or C-Core, that's something you're probably very familiar with, um, making sure that people have that information. And of course, any new products that come on site, new procedures, new PPE, um, we need to train our people in order to use them properly. Okay, and then training records. So when it comes to training records, um, they must be kept and they must be readily available if necessary. So um, one of the reasons we launched this e-passport is to make it easier for you to pull up those training records. Um, I know I've heard a million stories probably about how those passports grow legs and walk away and people don't ever see them again. So um, you do have to have that training readily available. And there's certain requirements in the act that actually specify certain training records be kept for an extended period of time. And those records include respiratory protective devices, so fit testing, um, as well as hearing conservation plans. So if you're training people, you're doing medical tests to make, see where they're at, and if they've you know, had hearing damage, things like that, all those records should be kept um, according to the legislation. Um, so with the e-passport launching uh, today, uh, some of the things that, uh, or some of our members rather, can take courses or have taken courses from sister associations or from other um, organizations. We do accept 
um, certain outsourced training. So some examples of that are St. John's Ambulance First Aid, um, the CODC Rights and Responsibilities, N-Forms H2S Alive, uh, Danatex Transportation of Dangerous Goods, or, or any of our associations uh, we have reciprocity with. So like heavy construction, or if you took some of your training in the Alberta Construction Safety Association, um, we will accept uh, some of their training. So if you have outsourced training and you want it to be part of your uh, SCSA e-passport, all you have to do is contact us and submit documentation of that training. Um, and if it's an approved training vendor, um, we will add it to your training records and then that will pop up when you open up your e-passport as well. Some training opportunities and requirements that are often overlooked. Um, so basic PPE. Um, it's quite common that uh, workers may never actually have like a formalized uh, time to go over use, care, and maintenance of personal protective equipment. Um, this can't be stressed enough with the way uh, the world is working right now and how much PPE people are using. So making sure that they understand how to use it, how to care for it, um, and what its limitations are. Um, again, company specific safe work practices and safe job procedures. So these aren't just meant to be developed and then to sit in a binder on a shelf forever and no one ever to look at them. So making sure that people understand how to do or how, what's expected of them, I should say rather, um, and how the company wants them to carry out their tasks. And again, any site specific orientation. So um, orientating a, an employee when they first come on is great, um, but they do need to have orientations um, when they go to each work site. So um, there's some legislation specific. So certain skills um, have specific training requirements in Saskatchewan. So um, powered mobile equipment, asbestos, first aid, um, and exposure control plans all have specific training requirements um, that are listed in the act. So if you work around any of those things or you need any of those things, it's good to be familiar with what the act says you need to have um, with, those, uh, with those specific skills. Um, so just some training FAQ. So um, do employers have to pay wages while training? So I have an excerpt of the act there that says the employer shall ensure um, that the worker does not lose pay or other benefits with respect to time during training. So yes, an employer does have to pay a worker to attend training. Um, and uh, as well, they may be required to pay for the training itself, depending on what it is. Um, and what specifically do we have to train workers in? So this is a, a really general question um, and section 19.1 kind of goes over that. So an employer shall ensure that a worker is trained in all matters that are necessary to protect the health and safety of that worker. Um, that's really vague for a reason. Um, employers have to prove due diligence. They have to prove that their worker knew what they were doing, that they had everything that they needed to carry out the job safely. So if you're asking them to do it, they likely need to be trained in it. Um, and I make our workers read our policies and procedures. Is that good enough? And the answer is no. So training requires a practical demonstration to ensure knowledge was also gained. Um, so this is going to come in the form of due diligence, right? Um, if you send your workers home with your policy manual and you expect them to read it front to back and bring it back the next day, um, likely if something happens, that's not really going to be a great defense for you. So the fact that training does require that practical demonstration to ensure that they gain that knowledge. Um, is very important. It's not just about read, sign here, and off you go. Um, and so just to kind of wrap it up and bring it all back to what we're doing right now in the world. So um, just regarding COVID-19, rather, um, some training and prevention. So what legislation applies? So um, when it comes to this global pandemic we're in, um, the federal or provincial public health orders um, are one of the things you wanna follow first off. So these include anything like travel restrictions, quarantine orders, and the physical distancing measures that we're using right now. Um, and with COVID-19, generally uh, with the workplace, you're gonna to default to the Saskatchewan OHNS Act and regulations. Um, and I just listed some things there that you might want to review if your workers are at risk of being exposed. So there is a Section 85, uh, is exposure control plan. So it talks about respiratory protective devices and how to develop that plan. Again, training of workers and what the responsibilities are. 
PPE general responsibilities on uh, training, fit testing, things like that, as well as respiratory protective devices is a good section to review and make sure that you understand what's required. So again, so pandemic specific training. So um, I know this is new and this is uh, the world's busy and we're try all trying to, to make do right now, but we do have to train our workers and how to carry out their jobs safely. So um, making sure that we have an exposure control plan if you are one of those businesses that is working with the public or uh, you know in homes, things like that. Um, likely you have new PPE that's come into your workplace. So masks, shields, guards. Again, we need to train our guys in, in the use, care, maintenance, and limitations of that PPE. Um, any new safe job procedures. So again, this is something that you're likely already doing. So working with the public, eye strain procedures, improper working posture, and psychological well-being um, are all important things to, to keep in mind and to train our workers to make sure that they're successful, whether they're working from home, working on site, as well, reporting procedures. So what to do if you feel or a worker has been exposed or potentially exposed, there was an incident, you're working alone or remotely, um, check-in procedures, things like that. So making sure that people know what's expected of them um, and what the, what the company's gonna do to protect them. And then just some training resources here. So again, CSA Advisory Services, if you don't know us or what we do, please give us a shout. Um, we can help you develop these programs, um, come up with procedures and practices to make sure that, you're, make, that workers are trained and they have everything they need. Um, again, Ed had mentioned the e-passport, so my.scsaonline.ca is where you will be able to open up that passport or activate your account if you haven't already. Um, if you don't have it downloaded, the STSA Guide to Legislation app is, um, is very helpful. Um, we have links on there about common, just common parts of legislation, can, like confined space, fall protection, and it just gives you a, a breakdown of what the legislation says and what the requirements are. And again, scsaonline.ca, um, under the resources tab and safety documents, you'll find a lot of different sample forms. Um, if there's something that you're looking for that isn't there, again, call one of the advisors and we can help you either develop it or maybe find, find uh, an example of it somewhere else. And that's it for me, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Um, I seem to be having some technical difficulties, so my video has quit again, as it likes to do about halfway through this webinar, but I am still here. Um, before we jump into the Q&A portion of the webinar, I'm going to check in and see if Lori has an update that she'd like to share with her department. Hi. Yes, I can give you a brief update of our what we'll be doing for our new core external audit process. Uh, we do plan to have more of a presentation later this week, I believe. But uh, the new plan is we will be doing those core external audits for the companies that are coming due. Um, if you are already due, we've sent you out a reminder package. We can coordinate the audit with you. It will be a remote audit. We'll be doing the electronic documentation. So we would ask the company to upload all of their documentation to an FTP site. Uh, then the auditor would work with the company to remotely conduct that audit. So we would be using a video conferencing type equipment like Teams. The auditor would send an invite to the company. Um, observations and interviews will be conducted that way. So we feel we can still do a quality audit, cover all the basis of the external portion. Uh, we'll just be doing it in a little bit different format this year. Great, thanks, Lori. And I see we have Adam on the panel as well today. Adam, do you have an update from training that you'd like to share with us? Um, no, not really. I mean, uh, we are offering our classes, so everybody just remember to keep on checking the website and calling your advisor and seeing what classes we're offering. And that's about it. Awesome. Yeah, I know the uh, training department's been working real hard on getting these classes out uh, virtually, so that's really awesome. We really appreciate that. Um, if you have any questions about signing up for a course, uh, you can register on our website, as always. Um, if there's any trouble there, just call our office in Regina and someone will help you book in 306-525-0175. So I think now if everybody's done with their updates, we can jump right into the Q&A portion. Um, first question we have here, ooh, we've got lots today. 
Will I be able to see training from other training facilities through the app, such as WorkSafe Saskatchewan? So I think we kind of handled this, but Ed, if you want to touch on that, feel free. Sure. Um, recognizing that's a valuable function and feature, uh, we will be putting that in the next version of the app, but it's not available at this time. Uh, next one is for training. So what courses are we offering now online? All right, so uh, we're offering Auditor, uh, LSE, um, uh, Safety Management, uh, OHC, and there's going to be more coming up pretty quick here. This uh, We have uh, Sherry in our training department. She's doing up the schedule right now. She'll be adding more of the classes on there. So please stay tuned. But for the big one, auditors now back or is now on the list. Uh, we did our first uh, auditor last week and everything went well. So we'll continue on teaching that. And then, like I said, LSE, OHC, safety management. And I know there's more going to be added. So just keep on checking online. Great, thanks Adam, that's awesome. Uh, next question, how up to date are the training records online? If I get Fall Pro on Monday, will it be updated on Tuesday? Right now it's not real time accurate. We are building um, more synchronizations into the system over time. Right now it should be about accurate within about 24 hours. Well, that's pretty good, thanks Ed. You're welcome. Um, I can see an update. Sorry, I see I can update my contact info. Can I update my passport picture as well? Yeah, what that will take is uh, getting in touch with our, our uh, support desk for that. It will be at epassport at scsaonline.ca. Great, thanks again, Ed. Lots of questions for you today. Um, so can I add training to my passport that I didn't take with the SCSA, for example, OHC level two? Now, I think we kind of touched on this again already, but uh, as Laura said, and Ed, you can jump in after me if you like, but as Laura said, if you call our office, send in that documentation, we'll be able to add that to your e-passport, I believe. Right, Ed? We'll make it real-time accessible in, uh, in the next version. Uh, right now, we don't have the ability to, to load third-party training records. Right. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Um, okay, the next question is, seats seem to fill up for classes before I get a chance to register. Can I set up an alert for when more classes or seats are available? Or can I be put on a waiting list and then contacted? Uh, I guess this one's for me, but uh, as it stands right now, I don't believe that there is an uh, option for us to put you on a waiting list to be um, notified. Uh, I'll have to double check on that, but uh, I can tell you for sure that you'll just have to be checking our website and our calendar to see about our updating. But I'll look into if we are offering any kind of a email notification about a class. That's perfect. Thanks, Adam. Um, the next question is, does the SCSA have a COVID-19 policy and procedure that I can use? I'll jump in on this one. Uh, yes, if you go to our website uh, and I'll put the link inside of the chat feature, the SCSA has many numerous resources based around COVID-19 from a standard procedure through to sanitization checklists, uh, emergency protocols, all of those things are found on our website and are accessible. And I'm adding them to the chat as we speak. Perfect, thanks, Bill. Uh, next question that we have here. If the SCSA is offering online courses with practical components, how do, you add a practical component over the internet. I think this is you again, Bill. So uh, currently with the fall protection class, there is uh, a number of practical components that are required to be completed throughout the course. 
uh, such as a harness inspection, a harness fit, as well as a couple of uh, quizzes and such that are held throughout the, the course of the, of the program. Uh, those are handled through Microsoft Forms, uh, also using some of the polling features within the Zoom, and as well the practical component of the harness fit and inspection are handled live uh, through the actual training course itself. So very similar as to it would have been when we were still in a uh, in-person class. Uh, you will stand up in front of the computer and demonstrate your ability to fit the harness properly. Um, the person on the other side, whether it's myself or another training uh, technician, will review the fit of your harness, provide feedback, uh, ensure that you have all of your uh, straps and stuff such uh, placed properly, and then uh, we'll continue that throughout the uh, all of the course participants. So you'll also get a chance to see not only uh, whether you can fit, you'll also get to see some examples of how other people fit their harnesses and the ways to properly adjust them. But it will be handled all through live through the uh, training course handled through Zoom. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, we're making some pretty big steps here on getting our members trained up. So bravo to the training team and the advisors that are helping with that. Uh, next question we have, can I put out of province training on my passport? Again, Ed kind of covered this already. Uh, the next version, we're gonna be able to do that third party. So just hold off for now, um, have your documentation. Maybe you can scan it in and have it ready to send off to somebody in our team to make sure that that gets uploaded when that is available. Um, next question, is there any cost to viewing my training information online? No, there's no cost of viewing the training information online. We view the student as owning their own information and we're just giving them access to it. Great, thanks Ed. So yeah, again, that's a free service that we're offering. Um, instead of carrying your passport around, you can uh, just bring it up on your phone for whoever needs to see it. And again, no charge. Uh, next question, how should I organize my files when uploading for C-Core? or do I upload them and then sort? Like that. Um, we would recommend that if you don't already do electronic documentation to get that pre set up on your system. Uh, we will give you an access to an FTP site. If you could look at the file structure that we provide for you, it may be easiest to duplicate almost those, those documents, um, folders that we give you that set up. You could then do all of that documentation set up on your own computer and then it'll be a lot easier just to transfer over to the FTP site is, is one option. Um, if you'd like to do it a little bit at a time, you, you could upload it that way directly to the FTP site. Uh, we can only give the companies access to that site for so long because we will have to keep giving those sites out to, to other companies as well. So we're going to provide a, a folder set up for you. We would, we would really like you to follow that organization of it. And the advisors uh, will also help the companies once the audits are set up. The advisors will be able to um, help those companies as well until that's all loaded prior to the audit. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, I was going to say um, you should have a you should have been assigned an advisor when you signed up for Core or C Core. So reach out to your advisor. We have all the information that you need for that, so we can help you get that set up. Uh, next question, does your Fall Pro training have an expiry date? Uh, okay, so no, our, uh, our Fall Pro does not have an expiry date, but I just want to make things clear that just because we don't have an expiry date on our training, uh, does it, or on our Fall Pro training, doesn't mean that the company doesn't. So just remember, you have your company policies. If your policy on your company says every three years you got to... Uh, redo some fall pro training even though that we don't expire that training course uh, that you still have to listen to what the policy says. Thanks Adam. Uh, next, I work with my roommate. Can we share a computer and harness for the fall pro training class? Um, okay, uh, so uh, now our the best case scenario is everybody's got their own computer. Uh, that is the best way to do any kind of class uh, over the internet. Um, so just to be clear, I mean, you can use an iPhone or you could use a tablet. 
uh, but a computer is your best case because we do have a test at the end of it and we also have a couple of exercises uh, for it. As far as the harness, uh, one harness, I mean, it'd be beneficial if you had two and then each of you could put one on at the same time, but time would allow you guys to be able to fit one and be evaluated, make sure it looked good, and then the harness can go to the next roommate, um, and then we could evaluate you there as well. Just to add to what Adam said, fall protection is running every Wednesday through the SCSA uh, in, a, in a live instructor-led format. So um, if you care to uh, have your roommate take it one Wednesday and then you could take it the next Wednesday, it's uh, a lot easier, as Adam said, there are some quizzes and exercises and final exams and such that come up displayed through the device that you're using. So to try to run it off of one device is, is time, uh, time consumptive, if, or sorry, I made up a word there. It's time, it consumes too much time during the class period. So uh, just proper scheduling, and uh, if you can, try to set it so that you take it one Wednesday and then your roommate would take it the next Wednesday. Awesome. Thanks, Adam and Bill. Okay, the next one we have, are the online courses going to be looked at the same way as the in-class courses, or is there going to be an asterisk beside it? Uh, right now, no. Uh, our online courses and our classroom courses, it's the same material. We're still delivering it. It's just over this uh, format of being on Zoom, but we are working out the, be able to uh, offer all our classes with the same um, uh, certificate that you would receive in the classroom. Thanks, Adam. Uh, next one. If I find asbestos in the siding at my job site, am I able to get training and remove it myself or am I to contact an abatement firm? Um, well, I would, I mean, you really, you could, if you really wanted to, um, but I've worked with some companies that abate asbestos and getting training isn't a one day course. Um, they often have to send workers out of province to get certified to abate asbestos as well. There's a lot of materials and tools you need to have, um, special vacuums with HEPA filters. So often it's not practical to try to get yourself trained to remove asbestos. It's often more practical to hire somebody that already has that certification. Thanks, Laura. Um, next one, this is probably for Adam. Do I need to have my video on all the time when I'm doing an online course? Um, yes and no. Uh, it is so helpful if your camera's on. It's, it gives us somebody to look at when we're talking to them. Uh, but also during test time, we want to be able to see you do your test. So for sure there, we would want to have your video on so that any kind of evaluation during the class that uh, we can see that you're doing the evaluation. So uh, beneficial throughout the whole course to have the camera on, but if you can, it's, we really want it on during the test or any evaluations that we're going to be Thanks, Adam. Next question, I am a little bit old school. When will I be able to talk to an advisor in person? I can answer that if you'd like. Um, right now, we are watching what the, uh, the public health agencies are putting forward in terms of recommendations. Uh, the FCSA hasn't identified a timeline for that yet. We'll be watching those closely. I would suspect we'll align very closely to what government agencies are doing. Okay, thanks, Ed. Uh, next, is a remote core audit going to be recognized as an external audit or will it temporarily, sorry, or, or will it, sorry, this is written funny, I have to, mm -hmm. just give me a minute. <laughs> is, is a remote core audit going to be recognized as an external audit or will it be temporary until the restrictions are lifted? Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's not temporary. The, the process will be this remote style audit for this year. It will count as the external audit for the company. 
Awesome. Thanks, Lori. Next, can I still get my certificates in printed form and get the stickers for my passport book? Absolutely. Uh, that hasn't changed uh, once you do get your tests in uh, past the class. We are still mailing out your certificates. Not unless I did, Ed, is that up to snuff? <laughs> Uh, yeah, the old process will continue to run for the foreseeable future, and we've just made this additional feature available to people who want to use it. Awesome. Thanks, Adam and Ed. We've got a couple more here. Uh, next, if I print my QR code onto a sticker, can I put it on my hard hat to use it for training verification? That's a good question. It will work that way. Whether that gets accepted as proof of training is obviously at the discretion of the regulatory bodies or the site itself. Okay. Next question. Does the SCSA conduct respirator fit testing or will we be? Um, I can tell you that we do not do any actual respirator fit testing for employees. We do have a confined space where we do talk about respirators and give people an awareness of what that looks like and what kind of testing that looks like. But uh, as it sits right now, I see it will not be performing respiratory fit testing on your employees. Okay, thanks, Adam. Next one here. Is the SCSA part of phase two in Saskatchewan? And if that is the case, am I able to get demos booked with an advisor? I'll jump in on this one. As Ed said, we're currently monitoring what uh, government officials say for uh, the safety of uh, social distancing or physical distancing. Uh, right now, I do know that our demos were filmed and recorded and I believe they're just working on that currently to have them available for download so that you can share those with your workers, uh, either using them as a standalone or possibly using them with a uh, advisor present on the other side of a Zoom meeting, providing the demo virtually at this time. But uh, be assured that as soon as that we've been given the green light to proceed with these type of things, we will be looking at uh, helping members find ways to book those for their workers and making sure that we conduct them in a safe manner uh, using all of the proper procedures laid out from uh, both provincial and federal governments. Perfect, thanks Bill. <clears throat> um, next one, I am having trouble activating my passport account. Who should I contact? If you're having trouble with the activation, uh, please send an email to epassport at scsaonline.ca. Um, also, you could view uh, the YouTube video I've uh, put in the chat or will put in the chat. If, uh, if that doesn't help, feel free to email that, send an email to the uh, epassport at scsaonline.ca email address. Thanks, Ed. Um, next one, is it necessary to monitor noise levels on site? Yes, um, you do need to monitor noise levels on site. So the legislation does um, specify, I believe it's 85, maybe 86 decibels is the maximum you can listen to for uh, an eight hour period. Um, as well, there's, um, like I mentioned in the presentation earlier, there's a lot of specifics in the legislation around hearing conservation um, and making sure that your workers are trained and they have the right PPE and that um, if here uh, high noise levels is something they deal with on a daily basis, then even having a medical assessment done of your workers prior to work, during work, um, to monitor um, how they're doing and if their hearing's getting worse. So yes, you do need to monitor noise levels and yes, you need to, to act accordingly. Just to add to that, there is a, a section within the regulations that uh, I've spoke at a numerous times at RSC meetings and otherwise, which is uh, noise control and hearing conservation. There's a lot of information, as Laura mentioned, throughout the regulations about how to protect your workers and testing and record keeping. And uh, 
with some time now during pandemic and proper planning for a safe and healthy workforce going forward, I highly recommend that uh, you take a chance to look at those starting in around uh, regulation 109. There is some information found back at 99 as well too, but that'll help guide you and your organization to providing a uh, uh, proper noise level monitoring for uh, your workforce through um, testing or having another organization come in and test or otherwise but there is a bunch of information found within the regulations as i mentioned that is very important that an employer understands to protect their workforce and uh, yeah take some time to to look into that and start putting plans in place to protect the hearing of your workers thanks bill uh we have one more question here can i change the password on my passport account Yes, you can do that through the uh, the feature where you update your profile under Activate Account. If you have any trouble, please uh, please contact ePassport at scsaonline.ca. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Ed. Uh, so we don't have any more questions in the Q and A, but one thing that I wanted to bring up because I have been speaking with members and a couple of them had had trouble finding the training um it's not going to be under i know that they're on they're technically online courses because we're doing them online but they're not going to be under the online courses button on the website so when you go to scsaonline.ca hover over courses go to schedule slash calendar and then in location you're going to want to search instructor-led online training and then that's where that's going to come up because i know i've had a few members uh call me and say i can't find ball pro or lse or whatever in the online training and i Think that was a little confusing so i just wanted to kind of put that out there um oh we got another question here on the q a how do i find out what courses are being offered online so same thing i just went through i wonder if my thing's not working if i can still share my screen sorry come on Can you guys see my screen? Somebody give me a nod. Perfect. Okay, so we're gonna wanna go to scsaonline.ca. Okay, so this is our website. Our courses are all gonna be here. So you can mouse over that, don't click it, go down to schedule slash calendar. That's gonna come with this. Now we have a calendar here that kind of shows you what we have going on right now in the near future, but a way to search what we're, what's being offered online is again, go to this instructor-led online training Make sure that all courses are clicked here. Hit view. And then it's going to come up with the, the schedule of classes that are being held online. So we have confined space on June 2nd. It tells you how many seats are left. Okay, contractor training. As Bill mentioned, we have Fall Pro every Wednesday. And quite a few seats left in that as well. LSE books up really quick. Auditor as well. These are some pretty high demand courses. So I know the training department's working hard on getting these out more often, but this is what we have right now. So keep an eye on this website. Make sure you're checking in to see what instructor led online training is being offered because those are the ones where we're going to do them via the Zoom platform. And we got a few more questions coming in. I'm going to try to get to all of these. If I run out of time, I apologize. And I will definitely send them to the Thursday group. We're going to be live again on Thursday from 9 to 10. So another question here, how do I find out? Oh, sorry, I did that one already. I need BTT. Is it available soon? Uh, as it sits right now, it is not available. Uh, we're still working on how we're going to be able to to BTT basic training techniques and an online scenario. So uh, I don't have an answer for you yet, but we will have an answer for you. Uh, please, again, just like Kara said, check our schedules. You'll, uh, you'll just see classes starting to pop up for the ones that we're not offering. BTT might be one of those ones right away, but again, we still have to work out some kinks on that class. Thanks, Adam. Another one here, would a workplace exposure to COVID-19 and them rising, sorry, them, sorry, can't read today. Missing work be considered a lost time incident and affect my WCB rating. Okay, so would, an ex, would a workplace exposure to COVID-19 
and then the employee would be missing work, is that considered a lost time incident? So as far as I understand it, if the worker contracted or was exposed to COVID in the, in the workplace, then yes, then they, you would go through WCB as a lost time incident, but it's if they are exposed in the workplace. So that, you know, that's limited. I mean, they would have to show that there was exposure, there was somebody in there that was sick. It's kind of a complicated situation. Um, but for in a black and white term, yeah, if you got sick at work, whatever it may be, COVID or some other illness, um, and you lost time because of that illness, then it would be considered a lost time incident. Right, so as Laura said, if something were to happen to you at work and you go home that day and then you show up for your next scheduled shift, it is not a lost time incident. But if you're gone that following day, following the incident, then that would be a lost time. And when you're exposed to COVID, they want you to do the two week isolation. They don't know how long it's gonna take for you to get the swab or get that those results back. So technically, yes, if you were exposed at work, that would be a lost time incident. Thanks, Laura. Uh, next question here, can I find information on the NCSO program online? Uh, yes, NCSO information is available on our website. There's a tab for NCSO. Um, it'll show you anything from registering to the courses that are required and some information about the exam. So all on our website. Thanks, Lori. And again, if you have any questions that you don't find on the website, feel free to call an advisor or call our office and someone will help you with any questions that you may have. So I think that's all we have for questions today, unless somebody has something that they want to bring up. I know, like I said, when I was talking to members, I had a couple of questions come up and I thought I should bring them up here. So um, I'll give everybody a chance to jump in and see if there are any questions that they would like answered for their members. And if not, I think we're probably going to get ready to sign off. Nobody? All righty. Okay, well, thanks again for joining us for this Ask the SCSA webinar. Again, we do these every Tuesday and Thursday from 9 to 10. Uh, the link is on our Facebook page for you to log into the Zoom account. We also share this live to Facebook every, every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, feel free to send in any questions that you may have. If you don't want to ask them on here, get in touch with an advisor. We're more than happy to ask those questions anonymously for you. Um, if you've missed any of the previous Ask the SCSA webinars and you want to check them out, go to our YouTube page. They're all on there. You can search them by day um, and then they'll have a description of kind of what we talked about in the title. Um, other than that, I think we're good for today. Thanks again for joining us.